Hey, I'm John Furrier here with an exclusive interview with Ali Gucci, who's the CEO of Databricks. Ali, great to see you. Preview for reInvent. We're going to launch the story, exclusive Databricks material on the keynotes after the keynotes, uh, prior to the keynotes and after the keynotes at reInvent. So great to see you. Um, you know, you've been a partner of AWS for a very, very long time. I think five years ago, I think I first interviewed you. You were one of the first to publicly declare that this was a place to build a company on and not just host an application, but refactor capabilities to create essentially a platform in the cloud, on the cloud, not just an ISV, independent software vendor, kind of an old term. We're talking about real platform-like capability to change the game. Can you talk about your experience as an AWS partner? Yeah, look, uh, so we started in 2013. I swiped my personal credit card uh, on AWS and some of my co-founders did the same. And we started building and we were excited because we just thought this is a much better way to launch a company because you can just much faster get time to market and launch your thing. Uh, and you can get uh, the end users much quicker access to the thing you're building. Uh, so we didn't really talk to anyone at AWS. We just swiped a credit card. And um, eventually they told us, hey, do you want to buy extra support? You're asking a lot of advanced questions from us. Maybe you want to buy our advanced support. And we said, no, 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 no. We're very advanced ourselves. We know what we're doing. We're not going to buy any advanced support. So, you know, we just built this, you know, startup from, from nothing on AWS without even talking to anyone there. So at, at some point, I think around 2017, they suddenly saw this company with maybe uh, uh, 100 million ARR pop up on their radar. And it's driving massive amounts of compute, massive amounts of data. And... Uh, it took a little bit in the beginning just us to get to know each other. Because as I said, it's like we were not on their radar and we weren't really looking. We were just doing our thing. Uh, and then over the years, the partnership has deepened and deepened and deepened. And then with uh, you know Andy Jassy really leaning into the partnership, he mentioned us at reInvent. And then we sort of figured out a way to really integrate the two services, the Databricks platform with AWS. Um, and today it's an amazing partnership. You know, we're directly connected with the general managers for the services. We're connected at the CEO level. You know, the sellers get compensated for pushing Databricks. We're, we have multiple offerings on their marketplace. We have a native offering on AWS. You know, we're prominently always sort of uh, uh, marketed. And, you know, we're aligned also vision-wise in what we're trying to do. So, uh, yeah, we've come a very, very long way. Do you consider yourself a SaaS app or an ISV? Or do you see yourself more of a platform a company because you have customers. How would you categorize your uh, category as a company? Well, it's a data platform, right? And actually, the the strategy of the Databricks is take what's otherwise five six services in the industry or five six different startups, but do them as part of one data platform that's integrated. So, in one word, the strategy of Databricks is unification. We call it the data lake house. But really, the idea behind the data lake house is that of unification. Or in more words, it's uh, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So you could actually go and buy five, six services out there, or actually use five, six services from the cloud vendors, stitch it together, and it kind of resembles Databricks. Our power is in doing those integrated together uh, in a way in which it's really, really easy and simple to use for uh, end users. So yeah, we're a data platform. I, I wouldn't, you know, ISV, that's an old term, you know, independent software vendor. You know, I think, you know, we have actually a whole slew of ISVs on top of Databricks that integrate with our platform. Uh, and, you know, in our marketplace, as well as in our partner connect, we host those ISVs that then, you know, work on top of the data that we have in the Databricks data lake house. You know, I think one of the things your journey has been uh, great to document and watch from the beginning. I got to give you guys cre credit over there and props. Congratulations. But I think you're uh, the poster child as a company to what we see enterprises doing now. So go back in time when you guys swiped the credit card. You didn't need any technical support because you guys had brains. You were refactoring, rethinking. It wasn't just banging out software. You had you were doing some complex things. It wasn't like it was just write some software, host it on a server. 
it was really a lot more. And as a result, your business worth billions of dollars, I think 38 billion or something like that, big numbers, uh, big numbers of great revenue growth as well, billions in revenue. You have customers, you have an ecosystem. You have data applications on top of Databricks. So in a way, you're a cloud on top of the cloud. So is there a cloud on top of the cloud? So you have ISVs, Amazon has ISVs. Can you take us through what this means in, at this point in history? Because this seems to be an advanced version of benefits of platforming and refactoring, leveraging, say, AWS. Yeah. Uh, so look, uh, when we started, there was really only one game in town. It was AWS. So it was one cloud. Uh, and the strategy of the company then was, well, Amazon has this beautiful set of services that they're building bottom up. They have storage compute networking, and then they have databases and so on. But it's a lot of services. So let us not directly compete with AWS and try to take out one of their services. Let's not do that. Because, because frankly, we can't. We, we were not of that size. They had the scale, they had the size, and they were the only cloud vendor in town. So our strategy instead was, let's do something else. Let's not compete directly with, say, a particular service they're building. Let's take a different strategy. What if we had a unified, holistic data platform where it's just one integrated service end to end? So think of it as Microsoft Office, which contains PowerPoint and Word and Excel and even Access if you want to use it. Uh, what if we build that uh, and... AWS has this really amazing knack for releasing things, you know, services, lots of them, every reInvent. And they're sort of a DevOps person's dream. And you can stitch these together and, you know, you have to be technical. How do we elevate that and make it simpler and integrate it? That was our original strategy. Uh, and it resonated with a segment of the market. And the reason it worked with AWS so that we wouldn't butt heads with AWS was because we weren't a direct replacement for this service or for that service. We were taking a different approach. And AWS, because credit goes to them, they're so customer obsessed, they would actually do what's right for the customer. So if the customer said, we want this unified thing, their sellers would actually say, okay, so then you should use Databricks. So they truly are customer obsessed in that way. And I really mean it, John. Um, things have changed over the years. Yeah. They're not the only cloud anymore. You know. Uh, Azure is real, GCP is real, there's also Alibaba. <clears throat> and now over 70% of our customers are on more than one cloud. So now what we hear from them is not only want, do we want a simplified, unified thing, but we want it also to work across the clouds because those of them that are seriously considering multiple clouds, they don't want to use a service on cloud one and then use a similar service on cloud too, but it's a little bit different. Now they have to do twice the work to make it work. You know, John, it's hard enough as it is. Like it's this data stuff and analytics, it's not a walk in the park, you know. Uh, you had to hire an administrator in the back office that clicks a button and it's just now you're a data-driven, digital transformed company. Uh, it's hard. If you now have to do it again on the second cloud with different set of services, and then again on a third cloud with a different set of services, that's very, very costly. So the strategy then has changed that, how do we take that unified simple approach and make it also the same and standardize across the clouds, but then also integrate it as far down as we can on um, each of the clouds so that you're not giving up any of the benefits that the particular cloud has. And I think one of the things that we see, and I wanna get your reaction to this is, this rise of the super cloud, as we call it. I think you, you're involved in the Sky uh, paper that I saw, your position paper came out after we had introduced super cloud, which is great. Congratulations to the Berkeley team wearing the hat here. But you guys are, I think, a driver of this because you're creating the need for these things. You're saying, okay, we went on one cloud, AWS, and you, you didn't hide that. Now you're publicly saying there's other clouds too, increased TAM for your business and customers have multiple clouds in their infrastructure for the best of breed that they have. Okay, get that. But there's still a challenge around the innovation growth that's still around the corner. We still have a, a supply chain problem. We still have skill gaps. You know, you guys are unique at Databricks as, as other these big examples of, of super clouds that are developing. Enterprises don't have the Databricks kind of talent. They need uh, they need turnkey solutions. So Adam and the team at Amazon are promoting, you know, more solution oriented approaches higher up on the stack. You're starting to see kind of like, I won't say templates, but, you know, almost like application specific 
headless like low code no code capability to accelerate clients who are wanting to write code for the modern era right so this kind of and then now you as you guys pointed out with these common services you're pushing the envelope. So you're saying, hey, I need to compete. I don't want to go to my customers and have them to have a staff for this cloud and this cloud and this cloud because they don't have the staff. Or if they do, they're very unique. So what's your reaction to this? Because this kind of is the it kind of shows your leadership as a as a partner of AWS and the clouds, but also highlights, I think, what's coming. Can you yeah. share your reaction? Yeah, look, it's uh um it's first of all, you know, I I wish I could take credit for this, but I can't because it's really the customers that have decided to go on multiple clouds. You know, it's it's not Databricks that, you know, pushed this or some other vendor, you know, that Snowflake or someone who pushed this and now enterprises listen to us and they picked two clouds. That's not how it happened. The enterprises picked two clouds or three clouds themselves and we can get into why, but they did that. So this largely just happened in the market we as data platforms responded to what they're then saying, which is they're saying, I don't want to redo this again on the other cloud. So I think the writing is on the wall. I think it's super obvious what's going to happen next. They will say, any service I'm using, it better work exactly the same on all the clouds. You know, that's what's going to happen. So in the next five years, every enterprise will say, I'm going to use this service, but you better make sure that this service works equally well on all of the clouds. Um, and obviously the multi-cloud vendors like us are there to do that. But I actually think that what you're going to see happening is that you're going to see the cloud vendors, uh, changing the existing services that they have to make them work on the other clouds. That's what's going to happen. I think. Yeah. And I think I would add that. First of all, I agree with you. I think that's going to be a forcing function because I think you're driving it. You guys are in a way one are just an actor in the driving this because you're on the front end of this and, and there are others. Um, and there will be people following. But I think to me, I'm a cloud vendor. I got to differentiate. Adam, so if I'm Adam Solevsky, I got to say, hey, I got to differentiate. So I don't want to get stuck in the middle, so to speak. Am I going to innovate on the hardware, AKA infrastructure, or am I going to innovate at the higher level services? So what we're talking about here is the tale of two clouds within Amazon, for instance. So do I, do I innovate on the silicon and get low level into the physics and squeeze performance out of the hardware and infrastructure, but I focus on ease of use at the top of the stack for the developers. So again, there's a there's a there's a tail of two clouds here. So I got to ask you, how do they differentiate? Number one, and number two, I never heard a developer ever say I want to run my app or workload on the slower cloud. So I mean, you know, back yeah. when we had PCs, you wanted to go. I want the fastest processor. So again, you can have common level services, but where is that performance? differentiation with the cloud, what do the clouds do in your opinion? Yeah, look, I think uh, it's pretty clear. I think that it's, this is, uh, you know, no surprise, probably 70% or so of their revenue is in the lower infrastructure layers, compute, storage, networking. And they have to win that. They have to be competitive there. As you said, you, you can't say, oh, you know, uh, I guess my CPUs are slower than the other clouds, but who cares? I have amazing other services, which only work on my cloud, by the way. Right, that's not going to be a winning recipe. So I think all three are laser focused on we're going to have specialized hardware and the nuts and bolts of the infrastructure. We can do it better than the other clouds for sure. Uh, and you can see lots of innovation happening there. Right, uh, the graviton chips. You know, we see we see huge price performance uh, benefits in in those chips. I mean, it's real. Right, it's basically a 20, 30 percent free launch. You know, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you go for it? There, there's no downside, you know, there's no gotcha or no catch, but we see Azure doing the same thing now. They're also building their ARM chips. And we know that Google builds specialized machine learning chips, TPUs, tensor processing units. Uh, so they're laser focused on that. I don't think they can give up that or focus on the higher levels. If they had to pick bets, and I think actually in the next few years, most of us have to make more we have to be more deliberate and calculated in the picks we do. I think in the last five years, most of, us, most of us have said, we'll do all of it. You know, we'll, we'll, well you made a good bet with Spark, Ali. You know, Hadoop was pretty obvious uh, trend that was everyone was jumping on that bandwagon. You guys picked a big bet with Spark. Look what happened with you guys. So again, I love this betting kind of concept because as the world matures, growth slows down and shifts and that next wave of value coming in, AKA customers, 
they're going to integrate with a new ecosystem, a new kind of partner network for AWS and the other cloud. But with AWS, they're going to need to nurture the next data bricks. They're going to need to still provide that SaaS ISV like experience for, you know, a basic software hosting or some application. But I got to get your thoughts on this idea of multiple clouds, because if I'm a developer, the old days was old days within our decade, full stack developer. Oh, I know. I guess two years ago, yeah. You know, it's like you know, it's a decade ago, full stack. And then the cloud came in, you kind of had the half stack and then you would do some things. It seems like the cloud is trying to say, we want to be the full stack or not, or is it still going to be, you know, I'm an application like a PC and a Mac, I'm going to write the same application for both hardwares. I mean, what's your take on this? Are they trying to do full stack and you see them more like, Absolutely. I mean, look, of course they are going, they have, I mean, they have over 300, I think Amazon has over 300 services, right? That's not just compute storage networking. It's the, the whole stack, right? Uh, but my key point is, I think they have to nail the core infrastructure storage compute networking because the three clouds that are there competing, they're formidable companies with formidable balance sheets. And it doesn't look like any of them is going to throw in the towel and say, we give up. So, I think it's going to intensify. <clears throat> and given that they have a 70% revenue on that infrastructure layer, I think they, if, if they have to pick their bets, I think they'll focus it on that infrastructure layer. I think the layer above, where they're also placing bets, um, they, they're doing that, the full stack, right? But there, I think the demand will be, can you make that work on the other clouds? And therein lies an innovator's dilemma. Because if I make it work on the other clouds, then I'm foregoing that 70% revenue of the infrastructure. I'm not getting it. The other cloud vendor is going to get it. So should I do that or not? Second, is the other cloud vendor going to be welcoming of me making my service work on their cloud if I am a competing cloud, right? Uh, and what kind of terms of service are they giving me? And am I going to really invest in doing that? And I think right now, we, you know, most, the vast, vast, vast majority of the services only work on the one cloud that, you know, it's built on. It doesn't work on the others, but this will shift. Yeah, I think the innovator's dilemma is also, also a very good point. And also add, it's an integrator's dilemma too, because now you talk about integration across services. So let, I believe that the super cloud movement is going to happen before Sky. And I think, what am I explain by that? What you guys did and what other companies are doing by representing advanced, I call platform engineering, refactoring an existing market, really fast, time to value and CapEx is, I mean, capital uh, market cap is going to be ex really fast. I think there's going to be an opportunity for those to can emerge. That's going to set the table for global multi-cloud ultimately in the future. So I think you're going to start to see the same pattern of what you guys did, get in, leverage the hell out of it, use it, not in the way just to host, but to refactor and take down territory and markets. So number one, and then ultimately you get into, okay, I want to run some SLA across services. Then there's a little bit more complication. I think that's where you guys put that beautiful paper out on sky computing. Okay. That makes sense. Now, if you go to today's market, okay, I'm betting on Amazon because they're the best. This is the best cloud win scenario, not the most robust cloud. So if I'm a developer, I want the best. How do you look at their bet when it comes to data? Because now they got machine learning. Swami's got a big keynote on Wednesday. I'm expecting to see a lot of AI and machine learning. Uh, I'm expecting to hear an end-to-end -end data story. This is what you do. <laughs> so as a major partner, how do you view the moves Amazon's making and the bets they're making with data and machine learning and AI? First, I want to lift off my hat to AWS for being customer obsessed. So I know that if a customer wants Databricks, I know that AWS and their sellers will actually help us get that customer deployed Databricks. Now, which, which of the services is the customer going to pick? Is it going to pick ours or the end to end what Swami is going to present on stage, right? So that's the question we're in. But I wanted to start with by just saying they're customer obsessed. So I think they're going to do the right thing for the customer. And I see the evidence of it again and again and again. So kudos to them. They're amazing at this, actually. Um, ultimately, our bet is. Customers want this to be simple, integrated, okay? Uh, so yes, there are hundreds of services that together give you the end-to-end -end experience and they're very customizable that AWS gives you. But if you want just something simple, integrated, that also works across the clouds, 
then I think there's a special place for Databricks. And I think the lake house approach that we have, which is an integrated, completely integrated, we in integrate data lakes with data warehouses, integrate workflows with machine learning, uh, with real-time processing, all these in one platform, I think there's going to be tailwinds because I think the most important thing that's going to happen in the next few years is that every customer is going to now be obsessed, given the recession and the environment we're in, how do I cut my costs? How do I cut my costs? And we learned this from the customers. They're adopting the lake house because they're thinking, instead of using five vendors or three vendors, I can simplify it down to one with you and I can cut my cost. So I think that's going to be one of the main drivers of why people bet on the lake house because it helps them lower their TCO, total cost of ownership. And it's as simple as that. Like I have three things right now. If I can get the same job done of those three with one, I'd rather do that. And by the way, if it's three or four across two clouds and I can just use one and it just works across two clouds, I'm going to do that because my boss is telling me I need to cut my budget. And he's and loving it. <laughs> Yeah, and I'd rather not to do layoffs. And they're asking me to do more. How can I get smaller budget, not lay people off, and do more? I have to cut. I have to optimize. What's happened in the last five, six years is there's been huge sprawl of services and startups. You know, you, you know most of them. All these startups, all of them, all the activity, all the VC investments. Well, those companies sold their software, right? Even if a startup didn't make it big. You know, they still sold their software to some vendors. So the ecosystem is now full of lots and lots and lots and lots of different software. And right now people are looking, how do I consolidate? How do I simplify? How do I cut my cost? That's and, you guys, and you guys have a great solution. You're both an arms dealer and an innovator. So I have to ask this question because I want to, because you're a professor of the industry as well as at Berkeley. Um, you've seen a lot of the historical innovations. If you look at the moment we're in right now with the recession, Okay, we had COVID. Okay, it changed how people work. You know, people working at home, provisioning VLANs, all that's more infrastructure. Okay, yeah, technology and cloud health. But we're in a recession. This is the first recession where the Amazon and the other cloud, mainly Amazon Web Services, is a major economic puzzle in the piece. So they were never around before. Even 2008, they were too small. They're now a major economic enabler player. They're serving startups, enterprises. They have super clouds like you guys. They're a force and the people, their customers are cutting back, but also they can also get faster. So agility is now an equation in the economic recovery. And I want to get your thoughts because you just brought that up. Customers can actually use the cloud and Databricks to actually get out of the recovery because no one's going to say stop making profit or make more profit. So yeah, cut costs, be more efficient, but agility is also like, let's drive more revenue. So in this digital transformation, if you take this to conclusion, every company transforms, their company is the app. So yeah. their revenue is tied directly to their technology deployment. What's your reaction and comment to that? Because this is a new historical moment where cloud and scale and data actually could be configured in a way to actually change the nature of a business in such a short time. And with the recession looming, no one's got time to wait. Yeah, absolutely. Look. The secular tailwind in the market is that of, you know, 10 years ago, it was software is eating the world. Now it's AI is going to eat all of software. So more and more, <clears throat> we're going to have, it, wherever you have software, which is everywhere now, because it's eating the world, it's going to be eaten up by AI and data. You know, the, AI doesn't exist without data. So they're synonymous. You can't do machine learning if you don't have data. So yeah, you're gonna see that everywhere. And that automation will help people simplify things uh, and cut down the costs and automate more things. And in the cloud, you can also do that by changing your CapEx to OpEx. So instead of I invest you know, $10 million into a data center that I buy, I'm gonna have headcount to manage the software. Why don't we change this to OpEx? And then they are gonna optimize it. They wanna lower the TCO. Because, okay, it's in the cloud, but I do want the costs to be much lower than what they were in the pre previous years. Last five years, nobody cared. Who cares, you know, what it costs? You know, there's a new brave world out there. Now there's like, no, it has to be efficient. So I think they're going to optimize it. And I think this lake house approach, which is an integration of the lakes and the warehouse, allows you to rationalize the two and simplify them. I, it allows you to basically rationalize the way the data warehouse so I think much faster we're going to see the 
why do I need the data warehouse if I can get the same thing done with the lake house for a fraction of the cost? That's what's going to happen. I think there's going to be focus on that simplification, but I agree with you. Ultimately, everyone knows everybody's a software company. Every company out there is a software company. And in the next 10 years, all of them are also going to be AI companies. So that, that is going to continue. I think it's and never I going to stop. It's never going to stop. And right sizing right now is a key economic forcing function. Final question for you, Alan. I really appreciate you taking the time. This year, reInvent, what's the bumper sticker in your mind around what's the most important industry dynamic, power dynamic, ecosystem dynamic that people should pay attention to as we move from the brave new world of, okay, I see cloud, cloud operations. I need to really make it structurally change my business. How do I, what's the most important story? What's the bumper sticker in your mind for reInvent? Bumper sticker, Lake House 24. You know, <laughs> that's, that's your data bricks bumper sticker. What's the event? No, I actually, no we're seeing it in the market. No, 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 no. You know, it's uh, AWS talks about you know all of their services becoming a lake house because they want the center of the gravity to be S3, their lake, and they want all the services directly work on that. So that's a lake house. We're going to see Microsoft with Synapse, modern, you know, the uh, modern intelligent data platform. Same thing there. We're going to see the same thing. Uh, we, we're already seeing it on GCP with Big Lake and so on. So I actually think it's the how do I reduce my costs? And the Lake House integrates those two. So that's one of the main ways you can rationalize and simplify. You get in the Lake House, which is the name itself is a portmanteau of two things, right? Lake House. Lake gives you the AI. House gives you the database, data warehouse. So you get your AI and you get your data warehousing in one place at the lower cost. So for me, the bumper sticker is Lake House, you know, 24. All right. Awesome, Ali. Well, thanks for the exclusive interview. Appreciate it and get to see you. Congratulations on your success. And I know you guys are going to be uh, fine. Awesome. Know. Thank you, John. It's always a pleasure. Always great to chat with you again. Likewise. You guys have a great team. We're big fans of what you guys have done. We think you're an example of what we call super cloud, which getting the hype up. And, you, and again, your paper speaks to some of the innovation, which I agree with, by the way. I think that that approach of not forcing standards is really smart. And I think that's absolutely correct. Um, yeah. That having yeah. the market still innovate is going to be key. Standards would kill it. In yeah. I, so. I love it. Yeah. We're big fans too. You know, you're doing awesome work. Uh, we'd love to continue the partnership. So great. Great, Ali. Thanks. Hey, okay, man. Take care.